In this short presentation today, I'd like to present a showcase of what you may study during your master's studies in Warsaw. I'll be looking at one of the um, most interesting, most notable papyri from the Roman Egypt, the so-called Petition of Dionysia, uh, published as P. Oxy 237. Why this papyrus is important? It is interesting because of the story it presents of a woman who successfully opposes her father. It is interesting because uh, it shows how in a multi-normative, plural society, norms interplay with one another, how the law is applied. It is interesting because it shows how the Romans try to understand what happens on the ground with the laws and the local customs. It is interesting also because it's been uh, the focus of my research um, uh, under the auspices of the Polish um, Centre of Scientific Research over the last um, years. Um, I'll start, however, with a very short introduction of the legal situation of Egypt under the Roman rule. One of the first questions that had been asked when papyrology was born was also the question of the legal environment of Egypt as such. In short, what happened to the local laws when the Romans conquered the country? Two theories were most recently presented in that uh, respect. Um, recently, that means <laughs> over the last uh, century. Hans Julius Wolf imagined that um, the demise of the Ptolemies deprived legitimacy of the laws, creating what he termed as a legal vacuum. Now, all norms had to be created anew by application by the Roman judicial authority. Melis Mojewski, who was inspired in that by his mentor Jean Godmet, thought of a different uh, solution. He said that the local laws were relegated to the place of customs, and every lawyer knows that customs are something less than laws, and they would be applied only in want of a proper legal norm, i.e. in want of a Roman law as such. Most recently, José Luis Alonso criticised that very elegant point of view, showing that actually it presented uh, the 19th century view on law, customary law and customs, as devised by a famous German pandectist, Puchta. So, what was the way in which law was applied in Egypt? That's the something I've been studying over the last years, and uh, I hope to be able to show with the use of Dionysia, uh, uh, with the use of Dionysia's claim, uh, a different approach to that question. Off to the papyrus. As I've said, it's one of the longest, if not the longest, documented papyrus from the um, um, uh, um, Roman epoch in Egypt. It was published over 120 years ago, but only partially by Grantham Hunt, uh, the Dioscuri of Papyrology. Um, uh, it comes from Oxyrinchus, um, an important city in Egypt, located on uh, the uh, Canal of Joseph, Bar Yusuf and a place from which thousands of papyri excavated at the end of the 19th century come, still some unpublished. Um, our team has presented new readings and thus enabled reconstruction of events, both um, how, what happened, but also the legal matters in that papyrus. I'll try now to very briefly explain what the issue of Dionysia and her father Hiramon was. So around 180 common era, Dionysia was given into marriage by her father Hiramon to uh, her uh, future husband, Horion. Uh, Hiramon was an important member of the local uh, Greek-speaking elite. He was a gymnasiarch, and maybe because of the uh, office he was uh, holding, he was in constant need of money. If you need money, you need loans. If you need loans, you need to give security to your uh, moneylender. In this case, a man called Asclepiades, also belonging to the same echelon of the Oxenheit society. Strangely enough, for us, uh, maybe for the Romans as well, uh, uh, women had something to say in that respect. Many Egyptian women, like Dionysia, had a hold, katohe, on the father's property. 
securing their rights um, 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 in case, uh, securing their rights. So the father had to ask his daughter for a permit to mortgage the family property, and that he obtained. Apparently, he was not a very skillful businessman. Um, he did not repay the loans, so at a certain point, Dionysia saw herself forced to overtake the repayment of the loans and um, uh, to manage the affairs of the property. The father was still in need of money, so he approached his daughter for, uh, for permit to mortgage even further uh, the property that was um, encumbered for her. This time she was smarter and she did not allow the father to um, undertake that legal action. The father found himself cross at cross. So what he tried was to um, seek judicial redress against his daughter. He petitioned the uh, highest judge of Egypt, the Roman uh, prefect, claiming that the right Dionysia had was actually legal and any kind of agreement he had entered with her um, about the management of the property was also void. It seems that this first attempt failed. Then he changed his strategy. He thought that he could try blackmailing his daughter. What would he do? He would try to divorce her from her husband and thus constrain her to give her permit. And that's the content of his second plea to the prefect. Um, and that's the content, as it seems, of our uh, document. So Hiramon, um, we know it from uh, he, the original petition which Dionysia quotes in her uh, reply, that's Pioxi 237. So Hiramon approached the prefect um, claiming that he had a right, according to the local law, to divorce his daughter against her will. He cited that law so the prefect, prefect would know. Um, it may surprise us that a judge does not know the law, but that was exactly the case even in the case of Roman law, let alone the local legal orders. We know this law existed. Hiramon cited it. Dionysia, of course, did not care to cite it further. But she very skillfully opposed her father's argumentation. First, she claimed inexistence of such law. Then, in a way that a modern lawyer would do it uh, nowadays in our pleadings, uh, she would say that even if the law existed, it would not apply to women of her standing. Women who are born to a written marriage and given away to a written marriage. Just to be even on a safer side, she further on said that even if that was not the case, then um, the Roman judges had constantly not applied that apparent non-existent rule to the Egyptian women. And to um, ground her argument, she presented legal evidence. A number of former judicial decisions, um, the edicts of the prefect of Egypt, and finally judicial opinions. Let me just quote from uh, the two of the precedents she cites. So, uh, in a case happening before Epistrategus um, Pacomius Felix, uh, um, a case very similar to, the, to that of Dionysia herself, um, the lawyer for the daughter and her husband informs the presiding judge that a similar case had been had by the prefect of Egypt recently. That's all about 50, 60 years before Dionysia, uh, um, Dionysia's own case and that the uh, prefect in question, Flavius Titianus, preferred the will of the girl over, I cite, inhumanity of the law. Pacomius Felix obeys, asks the girl through an interpreter what would be her choice, and on learning that she wished to remain with her husband, she decrees to be so. Now we come to the point of the local law application by the Romans. Remember, Wolf thought that uh, it was the legal vacuum, uh, malaise, that we would have local laws as customs. Um, how do I see that? Indeed, it seems that the Roman judge follows the concept of a Roman marriage um, um, and it applies it to the local situation. And that Roman marriage was something most unusual. Unlike anywhere else, 
it was based on the consent of the parties, as the jurists uh, remind us. Marriage can only exist if all agree uh, that is the parties and those in whose powers they are. Marriage is uh, formed by consent and not cohabitation, uh, as we learn from uh, the jurist Ulpian. The other side of it is that no one can interfere with already existing marriage, not the least the father. And that we find, among others, in a constitution, delocution and maximian that restate a principle already apparently voiced by Marcus Aurelius. How does it all sum together? It seems that the Romans, just like leaving in place uh, the local bureaucracy, the local uh, apparatus, the topographical system of Egypt, they also left the norms. Nothing happened to them. They would be still applied, as we see from Hiramon. Hiramon claims the norm to be applied, and only when they were expressively revoked, like in the cases that Dionysia uh, presents, they lost their power. If there was any rule in that ma to that madness, if there was, maybe it could be voiced as later law abolishes the early one, lex posterior derogat legi priori. Uh, if you want to find out any more about that, if you want to find out why Roman law could be interesting for classicists, how it could serve interpretation of uh, ancient sources, what juristic papyrology would be, do come to Warsaw, um, enroll in our master program. I hope to see you here uh, in the next year.